Hello and welcome to First United Methodist Church. I'm Reverend Michael Atkinson and I'm alongside a Reverend Harry Jenkins and we welcome you to our worship service on the Lord's Day, Sunday, March the 14th. As we begin our time together, I want to share with you a few things. The first and most exciting thing is that we will be here in person for worship starting Sunday, March the 21st. Again, masks will be required, as well as uh, social distancing uh, being observed, or physical distancing, rather, being observed. In addition, we have placed within the entry points of the sanctuary thermometers. Uh, they're infrared thermometers, uh, and we're inviting you as you enter into this place to, uh, to have your temperature read and uh, again, if you are normal uh, in your temperature reading, you're welcome to join us for worship. If not, uh, we invite you to consider the safety of those who have gathered for worship and uh, return home and consult your physician or other medical care so that you might uh, remain healthy. I want to share with you also that uh, during that service, we will live stream so we will continue to live stream our in-person gatherings. The cool thing about a live streaming on YouTube is that after we live stream, it is archived. And that means that you can have access to that at any point in time if you are not comfortable gathering in person for worship and miss the live stream on that Sunday morning. We will send out that link ahead of time uh, the week before so that you might know uh, how to access that YouTube page and access our worship service as you move through this time with us. A couple of other things is that uh, we are inviting you to help us decorate the sanctuary for Easter through our Easter flowers. You're invited to purchase a spring flower and bring it into the church in honor or memory of someone and you will be asked to give us that information so that we can include that in our bulletin on Easter Sunday, of course. And uh, we ask that you purchase your flowers and bring it to the sanctuary no later than March 31st. The other thing is uh, I, I want to say thank you for your support of our outreach mission uh, Easter Giving Tree, as well as our uh, Undie Sundays during Lent. Uh, we are blessed that you have responded in the way you have. We will continue to collect new underwear and socks uh, through the season of Lent, but if you have picked up an Easter egg for our Easter Giving Baskets, we invite you to bring that item or those items to the church no later than March the 25th so that we can gather those baskets together and distribute them before Easter. Again, it is a joy to be with you as we have gathered in this place for worship. God is good. All the time. All the time. I love you. I love you. You know, uh, when, when I started ministry, um, a, a colleague of mine uh, learned something along the way that he shared with me and other colleagues. He said the three most important rules that you need to embrace as you start ministry or as you are in ministry is this. Number one, love your people. Number two, love your people. And number three, love your people. I understand after 30 years of ministry, how important it is to love. This morning, we're going to hear Jesus' response to Nicodemus as Nicodemus came to Jesus in the night asking him questions about eternal life and belief in God. And Jesus reminded Nicodemus that God loves the world. We're going to hear that famous passage, John 3.16, and alongside of other passages that will remind us of God's love. We love because God first 
loved us. I hope that as we worship today that we may feel the warmth and love of God and then offer that love to others. Let us worship. Join with me in the call to worship. God loves us with a steadfast love. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. God loves us so much he gave us his son. Let us believe and have eternal life. God loves us with a great love, rich in mercy. Let us have faith to receive this grace. Give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. Let us pray together. Great triune God, we have gathered here in your name as an act of faith, believing that you are not only among us, but that you love us. It is often hard to recognize your love or see your mercy and feel your presence. Help us today in our worship that we might be transparent to your grace as you reveal yourself to each one of us. Amen.
I invite you to join me in prayer. Let us pray. Oh God, sometimes it is difficult for us to feel and experience your love. Quite honestly, more often than not, we find the things that we do and who we are, are because of our human condition, we even feel unlovable. Oh God, may we be reminded that you, that you are a God of love and that from your love we might find life, life eternal and life abundant here and now. Oh God, we pray that as we grow stronger in our relationship with you, that we might grow in our understanding and the depth of the love that you have for us and in turn grow in our depth and love for you. Please, oh God, help us feel your Holy Spirit embrace us to reassure us of your never failing love your steadfast love, your grace-filled love in our lives. For we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I invite you to join me in our responsive prayer of confession. God, we have sinned against you. We have spoken against you and your servant, Jesus. We have uttered lies. We have cursed you and others. We have said vulgar things. We have been consumed by doubt. We have been bitten with the venom of hatred in our world. We have oppressed the helpless we have been intolerant of others. We have delighted in violence, and we have spent money foolishly. Please, Lord God, forgive us our transgressions that we may be healed of our sin. I invite you now to offer your silent prayers of confession. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are all forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. And as forgiven and reconciled people, let us offer to one another and to God this prayer that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Hear the gospel lesson for today from John chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. This is the word of God for the people of God this holy day. Thanks, Thanks be to God. I invite you to pray with me. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. O oh God, as we prepare our minds and our hearts to receive this message from you, we pray that we may hear the voice of truth, 
that your Holy Spirit will open our minds and our hearts and that we might be doers of the word and not just hearers only. Oh God, I pray that you will use me as your vessel, as your channel, your instrument of grace and mercy. So, Lord, place me behind your cross, that in spite of who I am and what I do, that your light and your glory might shine above all that is said and done. For we pray this in Christ's name. And all God's people said, Amen. Oh, you may or may not recognize his name, but I would venture to say that you probably remember his antics, or maybe his witness, for that matter. Roland Frederick Stewart is his name. May not ring a bell. Maybe you know him by Rockin' Roland, or Rainbow Man. Who I'm alluding to is that that man that wore that rainbow-colored afro on his head and, and would hold a sign at sporting events, Olympics, or, or major uh, productions that were broadcast throughout the world. A, a, a sign, a poster, if you will, he would be holding that had John 3... 16. John 3, 16. And he captured the intrigue of America and the world for that matter. What is John 3, 16? Hmm. He was in stadiums, uh, arenas, and, and today we see the same thing under the eyes of athletes painted uh, in various places. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but may have eternal life. Now, Roland's witness turned south later in life, but nevertheless, in the late 70s and early to mid 80s he was notorious for the christian witness john 3:16 for god so loved the world i, I wish he would have put john 3:16 and 17 on it because i think 17 goes along with 16 in fact 17 maybe gives us a little more hope even than 16 John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. In other words, God is not in the condemning business. God is in the loving business. Oh, we've known that, haven't we? We've known that from the beginning of our time in Sunday school and vacation Bible school from the time that we've we've come to church. We've heard God loves you. And even before that, we've seen it, we've heard it in and around our culture. God loves you or Jesus loves you as we sing it in our day. So how do you preach a sermon on a passage of scripture that we've learned and heard about since we were knee-high to a grasshopper, you might say? Oh, don't judge me. (laughs) <laughs> Don't condemn me, but I, but I do have some thoughts about God's love and our receiving that love and, and how we offer that love to others. God's love. God's love. I've come to know God's love as an all-inclusive kind of love. 
In other words, God doesn't look at the color of our skin or the age of our skin or our bodies, where we come from nationally or what we necessarily believe in, what our gender is or our sexual orientation, whether we're Democrat, Republican, Independent, even if we're an unbeliever. God's love is still present. God's love is constant. But we don't often understand God's love to be all-inclusive, do we? We understand God's love more on our terms, the way we've experienced it, the way we've learned how to love in our culture today. You see, we tend to limit God's ability to love inclusively. We tend to limit God's love with our human boundaries. And sometimes, like we love even, we believe that God loves like we love. You know, we love because someone deserves to be loved. Or we love because of what they've done for us or maybe because they're related to us. In other words, we put conditions on the love that we share, and we think that God does the same. But God's divine love is much different than our limited love. Divine love has no boundaries. It has no strings. It has no conditions or criteria that need to be met in order for anyone to receive it. Did you hear that? That is amazing news, isn't it? That divine love, God's love for us has no boundaries. It has no strings, no conditions or criteria that need to be met in order for us to receive that love. God just loves. In fact, John, 1 John, says God is love. And I believe that. I believe that with all in me, with all of my heart, I know God loves me. How do I know this? I've learned it, and I've experienced it. I've learned it from the greatest love story ever written, first of all, the Bible. I believe that the, the Bible is God's love story, God's love story for humanity. And it tells stories over and over about God's redeeming love, how God continues to love his children. And I've come to know that love personally. As I've experienced life, those wilderness experiences where God has pulled me up out of the miry pit of despair, and I've, I've come to know the all-encompassing and embracing love of God. Sort of like God picking me up and, and dusting me off and, and, and giving me a pat and saying, Go on, Michael. Go on. Live abundantly. God, God's love story, we've recorded it in Scripture, has been recorded in Scripture. And, and, and if we look at that entire book, we learn so much about the nature of this divine love that God showers upon us. In the Old Testament, it was the love that stirred God's heart at the pleading Egyptian slaves. It was love that offered guidance of the law. It gave the law and security of the promised land. When inequality and injustice began to threaten the welfare of God's people, 
God was loving enough to raise up judges and prophets to remind the people of who they were and whose they were and how they were called to live in community with one another. And of course, in the New Testament, Jesus. Jesus was the manifestation of God's divine love. God's love in human form. He ate with sinners, the scallywags of his day. He touched the untouchable. He offered grace and mercy to people whom others offered nothing of the like. God is love. God is love. And we learn about that love in this greatest love story ever written. But it's also a personal thing, isn't it? I can remember taking a, a class at West Virginia University my freshman year, or actually my sophomore year of college. It was uh, Introduction to Religious Studies. And uh, Manford Meitzen was the professor, and he uh, was also, I think, the dean of the department at the time. But Manford Meitzen asked us a question one day in class, and he says, how do you know that you love or are loved? How do you know that you are loved? Or how do you know that you love? Wow. It stumped the whole class, honestly. We were all just sitting there trying to figure out where he was going. And he said this. He said, I don't know that words can really express how it is that we know love. But one thing is certain. We know that we know that we know that we know that we know when we experience it. We know it firsthand. When we encounter other people on the journey through life, we feel love and loved through others as they care for us, as they journey alongside of us. And, and those people are nothing more than instruments of God. Individuals who have chosen to love because God loves. From this love story and this idea that we know that we know that we know, we learn that divine love, we know that, the, that it was divine love that spurred God's action on behalf of God's people and ultimately the world. In other words, God is the one that's doing the acting. God is the one that's doing the loving. God doesn't love because we love God first. It's the other way around. God first loved us. And from that love that we feel and that we know for ourselves, we offer our love to him. God loves us because we are God's creation. As Paul preached on Mars Hill to the philosophers in his day, we are God's offspring. And if we were truly honest with ourselves, sometimes we have trouble believing that, don't we? That we, be, that, that we have trouble believing that we are children of God, sons and daughters of God. And because of that, we seem like our sinful nature, our not getting it right most of the time, makes us unlovable. But here's the good news. God loves us because we are God's children. And that is enough. 
doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter who you are or what you will do in the future. God loves you. Jesus loves you. Uh, uh, Karl Barth, the, the great theologian, um, was asked once as he was doing a lecture to uh, the students at seminary, he was asked, um, what's the greatest doctrine, the greatest teaching of the Christian faith? And he, he thought for a second and the room got quiet. And then he began to sing. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. As he finished, the class began to sing with him. You see, that's the greatest doctrine. The most important thing that we in the Christian faith can ever know is that Jesus loves us. God loves us. Not because we deserve it. Not because we've earned it. Not because we're morally good. But because God loves us. We're his children. And all we're invited to do is to receive it for ourselves. Just to open our arms and receive that love, that amazing gift, this generous gift from God for ourselves. I think Max Lucado um, puts it this way in, in his book, uh, Devotion, called Grace for the Moment. It, it just happened to be the devotion for March 10th in the morning. He says this. Maybe you can relate to it. God is crazy about you. God is crazy about you. There are many reasons God saves you to bring glory to himself, to appease his justice, to demonstrate his sovereignty. But one of the sweetest reasons God saved you is because he's fond of you. He likes having you around. He thinks you're the best thing to come down the pike in quite some time. Or, as I would say, the best thing since sliced bread. Even Anita burns bread. If God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. If he had a wallet, your photo would be in it. He sends you flowers every spring and a sunshine every morning. Whenever you want to talk, he'll listen. He can live anywhere in the universe, but he's chosen your heart. I like how Max puts it, and I think we can relate to that. God's love, God's love is amazing, and it's for ours to take, to receive better. But it's not something that we have to keep to ourselves. No. You know, you... You, you've seen those newlywed couples out there. Uh, you know, some people are just sickened by them. You know, the, the newlyweds that are uh, traversing the streets or in a restaurant by themselves at a table all snuggled. And, and you, you hear the giddy laugh and, and you see their faces and smile. And, and, and some of, it might make some of us sick to see. Uh, but uh, there are those of us who, who really enjoy that and watching that. It's not something that they can contain or even help for that matter because they are so captivated by that love that it becomes contagious. Contagious. A contagious 
kind of love. You see, when we claim this love for ourselves, when we experience God's love personally, it moves us to action. We can't keep it to ourselves. We're like that newborn couple. And people notice and they begin to ask, what have you been eating or drinking to make you, to make, uh, you so happy? What have you been what have you found, if you will? What have you found? Because I want some of that. I want some of that. It's contagious. And the beauty of it is that when that love enters our hearts and our lives, it moves us. Despite our human condition, it moves us to becoming more grace-filled people. Grace-filled people. We're more compassionate. We give, our, we give others the benefit of the doubt. We empathize with others more easily. We are changed because of that love. God's love does that, doesn't it? It changes us. It changes our behavior. It changes how we view the world. It changes how we view others as sons and daughters who too are loved by God. And it is through that love and through those actions as a result of that love that we've received that inspires us to advance God's love into the world. Did you hear that? God's love inspires us to advance God's love into the world. I chose that word intentionally because I think it has a stronger emphasis on an action, advance. I think more so than words like share and offer. Yeah, we offer God's love to others as we, as we uh, provide food at the grab and go or as we, as we collect things for, uh, for those, who, those children and adults who need underwear and, and, and the like. Sure. But I'm talking intentional action on our part to demonstrate God's love in the world. Advancing God's kingdom means making a difference in the lives of people that help them to help them know for themselves that they are valued, that they are children and are loved completely by their created, by their creator. Sorry. Friends, it's not enough to just claim God's love for ourselves. We are called to action because of it. So we can't sit on our haunches. We can't hoard God's love for ourselves. In other words, put conditions on it and choose to love certain kinds or types of people. We have to advance God's love so that people may know for themselves. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that through him the world might be saved. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is found on page 142 in the Methodist hymnal. We'll sing three verses of If Thou But Suffer God to Guide Thee.
this day we've been reminded. We've been reminded that God is love and that God loves us all because we are his children. As you finish your time of worship and you go about your week, may you be reassured of God's love. And may it create in you a contagious spirit so that the world might know, too, for themselves, that God loves them. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen.